This video looks at how to calculate the inverse metric for the Kerr space time using both software packages and the paper and pencil row reduction method. Um, now you might be wondering why on earth would you want a, a paper and pencil row reduction method? Um, and really mainly you're just looking for a way of checking your calculation. You've entered data into a software package and it's accurately produced a result for you, but is there a way of checking to be sure? I mean, how do you know you haven't entered incorrect data? You uh, put a two in or, or put in an element that shouldn't be there or, or you've left an element out. There's, there should be a way of checking and it turns out there is. And that's what the focus of this video will be. All right. So the Kerr space-time line element or space-time interval in Boyer Lindquist coordinates often takes this form here with a rho squared and delta in here, and the rho squared is defined by this object and delta by this one. Now written out in full, this is what the space-time interval or space-time line element looks like. Okay, it's quite an expression. All right, now the metric, the Kerr metric here, uh, in this form here, in a slightly abbreviated form, but written out in full, all terms takes this form here. Now it's easy to put this into a software package and find the inverse metric, which we often need for calculations. But um, to do this in a paper and pencil method in this form would be would take a long time and could be prone to all sorts of calculation errors. Okay, but so uh, but there is a shorter way of doing it, and that's what I want to bring up here, and that's what I'll be focusing on. But first, if we have a look at what the software produces. If we find the inverse of this metric here, okay, we want to find the inverse of that. Well, assuming we enter it correctly, um, this is what we come up with. Now, this is before simplifying. I mean, looking at this, you'd suspect, well, there's got to be some sort of trigonometric simpl simplifications here that will help us. And so suspecting that simplifying is necessary, um, we then ask our program, uh, in this case, in this program, I've used Mathematica and another one, GeoGebra. Now, GeoGebra is free on the web. It's an educational program, and I've performed calculations for the same metrics in both, uh, and GeoGebra will also find you the inverse as well. Uh, but it's free, it's free software on, on the web. Okay, now, um, the inverse, once we simplify with our software package, gives us this object here, which is smaller and simpler, more compact than what we've had uh, on, on the previous slides. But is there a way we can check this result other than doing the full calculation by hand, um, which would also be prone to errors as well. But it, there is a simpler way. If we don't write the uh, metric out in full, if we just use the labels for each of the functions, then we can use a paper and pencil row reduction method. So instead of substituting in the full expression for these terms, if we just use their labels instead, just the function labels, okay, and then we row reduce this matrix using a row reduction technique, it will give us a result that we can then substitute back into and check what the uh, software packages are producing for us. All right, so we're going to start with the row reduction method. So we begin with our metric here with the um, labels, not the full expression written out in full, but just with the function labels. And we set it equal to the identity matrix. And then we're going to perform a series of row operations to turn this left-hand side into the identity matrix at the end. And on the right-hand side will be our inverse. And that row reduction method, um, if you just bear with me, I'll just go through the steps. For those that need reminding, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the leading entry in a column and reduce it to a unity by dividing through or multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay, so we want to reduce that GTT term there to one, and we do that by multiplying by its reciprocal. So we multiply across the entire row here. So this becomes one, this becomes GT phi over GTT. And this one here becomes one over GTT. Okay, so that's our first step. And that gives us a one in that column. The leading entry in that column will be a one. And we're going to use that one, multiply it by objects, and then add it 
to anything to any other row below it where a leading entry is non-zero. We want to make this column here um, to uh, end up containing only a one at the top and then everything down here to be zeros. And we'll run that through. Okay, so now if you notice in the second, third row, there's only zeros here, there are no entries, so we don't have to work on those. The only entry we find is in the fourth row, the first element of the fourth row, and we need to eliminate that, reduce that to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply row one here by the negative of this, and then we'll add it to row four to produce a new row four. So multiply row one by the negative of g phi t, add it to row four to produce a new row four. Okay, so when we do that, okay, that multiplied, uh, this one multiplied by the negative of this and then added to this makes this go to zero. And then what we have here is that gt phi on gtt times g phi t, which is the same thing as gt phi, they're both, they're both the same element in, in the metric, in the cross terms. Okay, so what we get is um, g phi phi, um, and we've added the negative of this squared over gtt, which is this object here. So here's our expression in this element here. And then here, one over gtt multiplied by minus g phi t, okay, um, and added in here gives us minus g phi t on gtt, okay, and nothing else changes there because multiplying these zeros by negative g phi t is just zero and adding it to this fourth row here just doesn't change anything. Okay, next step now is um, we're going down now to the fourth row. See, the second column has zero, this, this, and this. A third row, a third column, sorry, zero, zero, this. We just need to reduce these to ones. Okay, so we can do that both in one hit. So we can multiply row two by the reciprocal of GRR. That will turn that into a one, and that will turn that into one over GRR. Uh, this row three, we can multiply by one over G theta theta. Uh, and this will turn out to 1 over g theta theta. So here we go. So far, our operations result in the first three columns uh, looking like the identity matrix. One's in the diagonal, zero everywhere else. The only step we need to do now is we need to reduce this to unity, to one, and we do that by multiplying it by its reciprocal and then performing that operation all the way across this row here. And then we should uh, almost be able to almost have the inverse solved by that point. So what we need to do is multiply row four by to reduce this element here to one. So we multiply it by its own reciprocal, and that will produce an expression, a larger expression over here, and that will look like this. So row four is multiplied by the reciprocal. Okay, that reduces that to a one. Okay, so here's our object here. Uh, the corner far bottom right term here becomes this. One more step to go. We just, we've almost got the identity matrix on the left. There's just this term up here. And to, to eliminate that, to return that to zero, we need to multiply this by the, by the negative reciprocal of this and then add them together. So minus g t phi on g t t times row four plus row one to give us a new row one. When we do that, we eliminate this term here. So we now have on the left the identity matrix, which means that what we have on the right here will be our inverse. This is our expression for the inverse. We're going to use that to check our earlier results produced by our software packages. All right, so this gives us the inverse metric here. So each of these terms. Okay, now how can we check that this actually is the inverse for the curve space time? Well, we can check it against the software packages and allows us to verify whether or not we've entered data correctly in the software package because these two results must agree with each other. So let's just take these cross terms here. Okay, and what we're going to do is expand using uh, each of these uh, metric terms. We're going to substitute them in to algebra 
and check that we end up with the same results of software package. Then we can have confidence that we've entered the data correctly in our software package. It's just a way of checking how accurately we have entered data in the software package and can we trust the result that's been produced because we haven't done the algebra ourselves. Okay, so substituting in for here will give us this object here. Okay, um, and then we, a little bit of tidying up. I'm not going to go through the algebra here, but a little bit of tidying up will give us this result here, which is what we discovered in the um, software package earlier, in both software packages, in Mathematica and in GeoGebra. Okay, so this is what we get in Mathematica and in GeoGebra, producing these results. And then we have the metric terms. The individual metric terms are here. You can just read them off. By what I've done is in the previous, uh, on the previous slide, where the metric label, function labels were, I've substituted in, and that produces this object here, which agrees with what the software packages were. I gave it earlier, and the individual metric terms are here. All right, it's a, it's a method I work with. Whatever uh, metric you've got, uh, you can always check. It's just a way of checking whether or not the software packages have done the right thing and, and you've entered the data correctly and you, you agree. If you can do it by paper and pencil method and by the software package and they both agree with each other, then you can have confidence in the result. All right, that's it.